I'm Ruth Wild and this is Kakan Qureshi and we're going to have a bit of an interview style chat with one another, ask one another questions. Mm -hmm. um, this came out of the recent protests in Birmingham. We both live in Birmingham and recently there have been protests against um, LGBT education in primary schools, I believe, mm -hmm. um, which was part of the equalities education um, and it's kind of teaching young children of under 11 about um, mummy and mama and me and that kind of book, you know, very age appropriate, yeah. <laughs> just about uh, the fact that two mum families or two, or two, two dad families exist, exist. Um, but people have got very upset about it because I think basically they think that it's all about sex or something. I'm not quite they, sure. They, <laughs> they feel that there's some gra graphic details there and they feel that they don't want to be teaching their... They don't want their children to be taught to be gay and they don't want them to learn certain words that they find quite sexually explicit. Right. Which is not exactly what That's, they're showing which in is, Yeah, I don't think they've actually read what's on the programme, but anyway. One of the books is called Mama, Mummy and Me, I think. Yes. One of the books is about some it, gay penguin dads. It's um, and Tango Mix 3, which <laughs> is about it. two male penguins who adopt a little yeah. um, egg and which becomes a chick. Which is just super cute. Um, and one is about My Princess Boy, which is based on a true story about a little boy who likes to dress up in um, yes. fairy mm -hmm. princess kind of dresses. Kind of girly things. Girly things. Yeah. And he yeah. just goes around saying, Mommy, I'm a princess boy. So it's quite Which a shame. is just like so cute and actually really important to support kids that might feel different or whatever. Uh, and it's a shame we don't have, actually have the books with us. We could have gone through yeah, them. Yeah, we could have gone through them, haven't we? We didn't think about that. Anyway, so we're here to expand on that, kind of just, well, prompted by that we wanted to have a conversation between a gay Muslim mm -hmm. and a gay Christian. So I work for Inclusive Church, which is a charity on, that works on all sorts of inclusion, not just L, um, LGBT, but also disability and mental health and everything in the churches. Kakan, you do what? Uh, you my, do? One of my, my day job is I work with homeless people, but my other role is I run a South Asian LGBT social support group called Finding a Voice, which is based here in Birmingham and has been running for about five years. So we've both kind of involved in this kind of LGBT and Either faith Kakan. work. Kakan. Oh, sorry, Kakan. <laughs> yeah, oh my fine. goodness, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> that's fine. I never even asked. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Um, so yes. So um, okay. So sorry. My name's Ruth. No, it's not Ruth. It's Ruth. <laughs> that's um, fine. Ruth. <laughs> as an <in> Eli Ruth. <laughs> not really. Um, yeah. So if you pronounced it as it was spelled, it would be Ruth, wouldn't it? So that just goes to show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so we're basically, because of this whole thing, the reason we came together as a Muslim, um, I was going to say Muslim Christian, then that would have been weird, a Muslim gay person and a Christian gay person is because we saw the protests, uh, which Kakan yeah. has been more in, in, involved in than I have actually in Birmingham, which, and they were mostly the, mo the majority of people that have been protesting in Birmingham against schools teaching these um, these little books and things, um, equality education, to children have been Muslim parents. Yes. And so in the media, it was beginning to become, I think, a bit of a kind of Muslim v LGBT. Thing. Yes. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to have this chat because to dispel the myths, firstly, that you can you can't be Muslim and gay because it's not true. Mm -hmm. You can be Muslim and LGBT, gay, trans, there is everything under the sun. Um, and you can also, I'm here to say, you can also be Christian and gay. Um, because I don't think being LGBT discriminates anyway. You know, you can't say it's an elite um, aspect of your being, is it really? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you, know? you can't say, oh, because I was born in a Christian family, I, I, that, that didn't happen. That I didn't, didn't become happen. gay. You know, I think it's, it's just You're part just of born the, gay, really, so born it's like... Yeah. I think we've, we've always been here since millennia. You know, there's yeah. no denying it. If you look at history, arts, um, you do your research, you find that we've always been here. In terms of our terminology, like homosexual or lesbian, those words didn't really exist. But in the actual sort of attractions, I suppose you want to call it, we've always been here, you know. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. some cultures, we've been accepted completely. And then obviously through time, how things progress, people feel that, I don't know, they might feel insecure and they place barriers there and put us into boxes. Yep. Some of us are supported in that box and some of us are absolutely crushed. Mm -hmm. And there's even evidence today in certain Muslim majority countries that there are certain types of LGBT people that are more accepted. 
you know, maybe not all, but like, for example, there's trans people, I think, quite accepted in some uh, in the, the Asian subcontinent, you know, yeah. um, they're, they're accepted in India and Pakistan in particular. I think that's more to do with um, superstition and culture, you know, because okay. I know, I remember my first interaction with what they call hijra or trans individuals yes. mm -hmm. or kusra who came to the wedding and they sort of, they're there to either bless you or they curse mm -hmm. you. Um, mm -hmm. If you deny them, um, deny them access to see the bride and the groom or anybody else involved, they, they will curse you. Mm. But if you allow them to, to come in power, and bless, actually. They're kind you of, know, yeah. They're given this power in the culture, actually, that's kind of almost like they are um, spiritual, you know, um, like, for example, I worked for a short time, just a two-week stint, I'm not yeah. an expert, yeah. but with Native American people in Canada, uh, with a Native American tribe, and I learned that quite a lot of Native American tribes, I don't know if it's all, but quite a lot, have historically always had two-spirited people, yeah. who are basically the LGBT umbrella, yes. and who were prized as kind of medicine people and kind of spiritual healers and things. So it's almost like it's a similar, similar thing similar in terms thing. of they've got that actually quite high status in a way that they're quite important but also have a bit, quite a lot of power in that way. They, they have the high status I think maybe because of those particular issues in terms of healing, spirituality mm -hmm. and what have you. But I, I think the other side to that is that they're not recognised as citizens un until recently really. Yeah. Because it's like we talk about othering and I think when they're when they're trans individuals or hijra, kusra, mm -hmm. they're put into that box where you're not too sure, they're not really fitting that binary image, are they? What have we all identify? Yeah. So it's like you're othering that individual or that mm -hmm. community, aren't you? So you're yeah. either going to put them, elevate them or denigrate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, because of, because it? of Section 377 in India in particular, mm -hmm. and they've also recently gained um, legal recognition, haven't they, in India? So I think... Um, I think they've recently made it also legal to have um, same-sex relationship relations, like um, in India. I yeah, think I yeah, think they struck down the colonial law they're, they're, against homosexuality. Yeah, they've decriminalised well. Section Three Seven Seven. Not which that is, there which won't be still prejudice against, I'm sure, but they've yeah they've got rid of that. And in Botswana as well recently, which is really there's cool. quite a few countries which yeah. are striving forward, but then you, they go so many steps forward and then so many steps back. Mm -hmm. um, it's like last year I met with some. Um, government officials from Malaysia mm -hmm. and I asked them about you know why do they have this anti-LGBT attitude um, they were saying it's not us in the community it's fine we're accepting of the LGBT community but what the difference is is that because they're Muslims and the government being obviously Muslim they're the ones who you know try to squash what's happening because it's written in their laws and policies yeah um, but I yeah. said it's not helping in terms of their economies it's not helping because if I'm an, an outsider and I'd wish to visit Malaysia as a gay Muslim, mm. I'd be put off by that idea yeah. completely. Totally, um, yeah. But they're saying that they're accepting of LGBT within the community, but what they don't accept is if they were to, um, what's the word, if they were to act indecently mm -hmm. within the community. For example, they talked about um, a young lesbian couple who were found possibly kissing in the car, I'm not too sure, mm. but they were found and it was indecent uh, exposure, and they were punished for that. And but my argument to that was, if they're a couple who are consenting, mm. um, why not leave them to it? What business was it mm. of anybody else's? So they basically will accept it, but only if it's hidden away. Kind of, yeah, mm. kind of. But mm. even then, it's I said, but it shouldn't have impact on anybody, you know, in in whatever country if you're Muslim, yeah. about how two consenting adults interact, really. Um, but they, they came back with, but do, do you not have um, indecency laws in the UK? I said, yeah, of course we do. You know, we mm. do sort of arrest people if they're if exposing they're like themselves or, or something, <laughs> or doing you know, something yeah. or, or fornicating in a public arena. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if people are just showing affection, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, public displays of affection, then why should they be punished for that? Mm. Um, mm. So it's, it's quite sort of trying to figure out where the middle ground is. Mm. You know, but here, I think in the UK, um, we do have levels, I, I suppose we call it levels of extremism, mm. like going back to the protesters. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's quite an extreme thing to do. How did it make you feel? Um, I'm, I get quite emotional about it anyway, because mm. I feel that there's two parts of my identity that are clashing here. Mm. Um, 
One is that it's the fact that it's Muslims, mm -hmm. and I look at it and I'm thinking, but not all Muslims behave that way, and not all Muslims are strongly anti-LGBT. If they are, they possibly keep it to themselves. Mm -hmm. But in my 49 years, I've not experienced it in Most that, Muslims are moderate, actually, in this that, country, I think. To, to mm -hmm. that extent, where they're actually chanting mm -hmm. outside primary school gates, mm -hmm. you know. But then the other side to that is, you know, as, as an LGBT individual as well, mm -hmm. you just think, where is this coming from? Because to me, it reminds me of Section 28, yeah. um, when, you know, all the schools are banned from preaching or promoting homosexuality. Which means yeah. basically speaking about it at all. Yeah, and yeah. you know, that's that quite, exist, quite, quite horrifying really. Yeah. You know, and for me, my coming out experience at that time was, uh, it was not good, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, because you came out under Thatcher. I definitely came out under Thatcher. <laughs> under Section 28. Uh, under Section 28 at the height of um, HIV, AIDS, yeah, yeah, yeah. and having that religious guilt as well, as I call it, religious guilt. Yeah. You know, because coming from a Muslim everything, background. everything really, um, going yeah, because coming from, a, a, coming from a Muslim background, um, and not to say that my family were too traditional, I thought we were quite mm. liberal in our own ways, mm. but again, it's about the psychological impact it has, yeah. and how you kind of navigate it, and I'm really fortunate that I managed to navigate it quite well, mm. um, but going through it all, it does impact onto your self-confidence, sure. makes you really insecure, mm -hmm. you develop low self-esteem, mm -hmm. and you can't manage it as best as you can. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why I really advocate on behalf of these, the teachers and the schools mm. um, because I'm thinking what a great opportunity to discuss and mm. explore. And to feelings. make those children feel like they're, they don't, they're not abnormal. You know, they might be in the minority, in that, yeah. way, in that way they might be um, not part of the norm as it were, but they're not, that it's okay <laughs> well, it is know, okay, to you be know. a bit different and to be LGBT or whatever. And, and that's, you're right, that's even when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a Christian family, um, quite a fairly evangelical Christian family, although not like really extreme, um, and my parents were very loving and I had a very good childhood mostly, but I knew that it wasn't okay to be gay. Um, my parents have changed their view on this now, is it thank you, goodness. You knew, is it you knew or you were conditioned to say that? Well, I knew that, I knew that that was the messaging I was hearing mm. in all the churchy things that, I was going to, all the Christian events, all the Christian festivals, everywhere I went. It's almost it like sub the subliminal, it's either subliminal conditioning sometimes not and even sometimes like got direct, very direct, yeah, isn't sometimes it? Sometimes very direct. And, and that's why what I, would, what I would do is encourage anybody who is feeling somewhat, I don't know, insecure about their own feelings, mm -hmm. rather than taking on board what people are telling you, like we did, is go away and research your holy books, read them properly, the Quran, the Torah, the Bible, um, whatever faith or religion that you, you adhere to, follow and read the books and make up your own mind as to how you interpret it rather than mm. sort of take on board what other people are saying. And read around it as well. Yeah. You know, it's so important to study. I think it's a very weirdly Christian thing. I don't know if this is true in, in Islam, but it's a weirdly Christian thing because it's not Jewish to, to decide that it's being the strongest Christian is the ones, the, the, the strongest Christians are the ones that don't question or read around or study the Bible. It's like in no other field would you say yeah. you're the most serious about that subject if you don't study it. If you it. don't study it, It's yeah. absolutely bonkers. But, and of course in Jewish tradition they argued with scripture, they you know, studied scripture, there was lots of writing around scripture. You know, I think even to a certain extent, like I don't know so much about Islam, but you know, there's the Hadith and yes. there's the writing around the scripture and it's like people can talk about it, can debate it, can say, oh, wonder about what it meant in this passage. Or, whereas I feel like a lot of, n n not all evangelical, but a lot of more conservative evangelical Christians, that it's almost prized to not study. And studying leads you down to kind of a, yeah, a place where you won't believe in Christianity anymore or something. But I think even if you look at all the faiths anyway, mm -hmm. they strongly, in the, in the Quran anyway, it does strongly encourage that you educate yourself. Yeah. And even, yeah. you know, the, the good scholars or the good Christians or Jewish people, they will ask you to go and educate, learn, you know, mm -hmm. and try and make sense of what's happening and understand. Because I, my argument lately is, why should I go and speak to a scholar about the Quran or what it means? Because the messengers, messengers, <laughs> messi messages coming across <laughs> are about... You know, these so we're books, talking about angels. <laughs> yeah, you know, these are these are about um, 
you know, everybody has to learn for themselves. Yes. Because if it's, if faith and religion, like being Muslim, is between me and Allah, mm. then it's between me and Allah. Why should I go to somebody creating another two or three tiered hierarchical system mm. to understand what the Quran says? Yeah. Somebody recently said to me online, said, um, you know, your insight is different and actually he's one of the main lead protesters. Mm. I really. And said, what he suggested is that I go and speak to a, a scholar with a PhD. Mm. My response is that, but you know, Islam is not elitism. No. And know? that's the other side of being against study at all. So you might, in the Christian side of things, we might sometimes have this anti-academia um, side. Yes. Where you're like prized for not studying it because it might be dangerous or something to study. But then you've got the other side of it, which is that elitism, which is like only people with PhDs Yes. know about this religion when actually what you need to do and what we all need to do is read lots of different things around it not just be told by one person with a PhD because that's just a power that's a hierarchy that's a hierarchy that's just yeah. a power thing going on there you know that one person I've met, come across people with PhDs that were not like I don't think were great yeah. in the biblical stuff you know and, and actually the other thing I'd say from my perspective as inclusive church national coordinator is that Often the best and most interesting perspectives are from people on the margins themselves. Yes. So a lot of people that are in that elite are not mar marginalised yeah. people. They're often people that are white, straight, men, or not maybe in yeah. the case yeah. of your PhD Muslim guy, but, you know, straight men, you know, yes. older guys, yes. and all the same kinds of people. Um, and I they're not actually getting that vision and insight that you get when you're a marginalised person. I think the difference, I mean, not the difference, but I think the similarities within all faiths anyway, from my living on this earth, is that a lot of the information that is shared comes from predominantly straight men, whether they're white Christians or brown Muslims. Yeah. You know, and to me, that's all about ego and power trips mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, if you go back to history and how people were learning, you know, they, they weren't reading and writing, were they either? You know, they were like they are now, mm. but a lot of the communities came from agricultural backgrounds. And if it just took one voice to say, Oh, actually, this is what the Quran says, or this is what the Bible said, mm. you know, and then if they say enough times, you begin to believe it because you don't know anything else. But that yeah. one individual who appears to be very well educated yeah. and informed can have too much power, can have too much power mm -hmm. and say, Oh, no, if you don't, if you don't give me that 500 pounds, God and will strike yeah, you down yeah. or the devil is at play mm -hmm. and if you're vulnerable you're going to be put into a position of yeah. exploitation and abuse really yeah, and here we are in the 21st century that's what's happening to people again mm -hmm. isn't it you know yeah. if you give us five thousand pounds i can cure you of your lgbtism yeah, 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 yeah. and you have to think about as well throughout history as, as to why certain messages have been told you know because if you if you start to compare other things that were were told certainly in Christianity, you know where people argued for slavery yeah. from the Bible yes. and that that kind of thing, and you think, oh, so why are they now arguing against LGBT people? Is it possibly because the people that kind of were arguing this were straight people, yeah. were people with lots of power over minorities, and actually did they bring their own prejudice to the Bible? You know, we've got yes. to. I think this is another thing that, that is, a, is a myth, is that certain people who believe they're being literalist about the Quran or the Bible have not brought any, any kind of baggage or any prejudice to the Bible. All the other people are just making stuff up around it. Yeah. But that's not true. We all bring our baggage. We all bring our opinions onto the Bible or onto the Quran. And then we go, I'm right. <laughs> That's, yeah. And actually, it's the only difference between a conservative Christian and my and myself is that I'm hopefully, I'm aware of my own. I hope I'm aware, more aware of the fact that I do bring all that stuff, and I, I try to critically analyse what I'm doing. Yes. Because I'm going, yeah, I'm bringing that. I'm reading it in this way. Yes. Maybe I need to th read from a different perspective how someone else reads it. You know. Yeah, because it's all about perceptions and interpretations, isn't it? And when I was when I was coming out. I trying to make sense of it all as to what it means to be LGBT or you know what does the scriptures actually say. So I did read the Quran and the Bible to try and make sense of it all, and then I'm thinking these are really powerful tools more than anything. And how I was thinking, how does the world as we know it? Why does it focus specifically on that particular act? 
because the rest of the, the Quran and the Bible mm -hmm. is talking about a whole load of other issues yeah. that affect the world, you know, women's issues, um, childhood, etc, etc. And yet somehow we kind of accept certain things yeah. and then that particular story of Lut in particular is what people keep referencing. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, how does that yeah, make lot, sense? Yeah. You know. We have the same story. Yeah. So what's your interpretation? The Sodom and Gomorrah story. Yes. Yes. Well, it, it, I think that actually uh, hardly any people argue that that it's about homosexuality anymore. Hardly any Christians will argue Within that Within your anymore. circles? It, for a long, long time. No, in all circles. Oh, okay. I just don't think it's accepted anymore, really, as an argument. There are other arguments that people who don't agree with... with more conservative sort of, Christians. Yeah. Who, there are other arguments, for example, from Romans 1 and other book places which are hard, like I think have 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 got more to them that you have to argue you know you have to there are ways of like there are arguments against reading it home, in a homophobic way I think that are very historical and put it into its context and stuff but they are in some ways stronger than the Sodom and Gomorrah which even within the Bible itself, it says it's nothing to do with that. It says it's to do with hospitality yes. and treating the yes. strange. You know, so even the, the the argument is so weak because within the Bible itself, it argues something completely different. So it, it can't be about homosexuality because it says in the Bible it's about you know hospitality, I mean, it's about hospitality. Rape, desire, greed, corruption. Yeah. Um, you know, incest. And it's massively problematic, isn't it, if you're saying, oh yeah, the, the sin there was homosexuality, when actually, oh, so it's perfectly fine, is it, to give your daughter to somebody to, somebody, to yeah. have, be raped and stuff. That, you know, it's so problematic, ethically problematic, to read it in that way. So, the, when the, 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 the more famous line is something about, oh ye who are transgressing people, that's the part that everybody that, in the, especially in the last few months, they're the ones that, that's the line that they quote to me from the Quran. So what's your interpretation of this? Uh, so say that again. It's something about, um, he says to the people, or the men, mm. that they are transgressing people. Mm. I can't remember that line in the Bible, whether it's, whether it's the same, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but I, I think, all, what I, from what I remember from the story, it's... Is it some angels? Or yes. So, yes. They, they, so they appear at Lot's house. Yes. Um, and the, the, the men of, the, the, of Sodom uh, want to basically rape them. Yeah, basically. Um, and he says, no, don't do that. Um, have my daughter instead. Which yeah, nowadays is absolutely horrendous side. ethically for us. That's just not okay to give up your daughter. But back in those days, and this is where histori historicity is important and understanding context is important. Back in those days, Thousands, literally thousands of years ago, you know, women were not considered really as mm. full people. So it was okay, to, apparently, in those you know those days, to just give up a woman. Whereas to 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 do that to strangers was shocking because hospitality was so important. Yeah. Looking after strangers in a village was really really important in that culture. And so this is where you just think actually, people that refuse to study even anything to do with the context or the history, hist historical, you know. Um, the time of when it was written and the, and the culture of the time they're just they're completely misunderstanding it entirely it's not that I'm trying to because I know, I know that some people more conservative people will say to me oh you're just trying to get round it yeah. I'm not trying to get round it's it just trying it's to, just, uh, you're the one that has tried to make it about today the 21st yeah, century yeah. it's, it's got a completely different context because I was reading um, talking about research I, read, I was reading about that particular story again and they were saying that at that particular time, the, his daughters mm -hmm. were of an age where they're developing, you know, they were becoming quite curious about their sexuality and about what men look like and all that type of thing. So I can't remember where I read it, but there was one that they approached this, They approached him while he was asleep and he was naked. They wanted yes. to look at his, yeah, yeah. you know, genitalia. Yeah. So and he was thinking, oh, they're of, that, of an age now where they need to be kind of um, mm -hmm. passed on to other people. So mm -hmm. when he offers them as a, whether you want to call it, sacrifice mm. or otherwise he's thinking that they need to move on yeah so I mean it, it in a, from from my point of view and from most people's point of view nowadays all of those things are not good yeah <laughs> and what happens is when you read it with the eyes of somebody from now and you don't try to take any of the context into into context um, then what happens is you are making that passage really problematic because yeah. you're then ignoring 
whole enormous problems in the text. You're ignoring the fact that there's women being given up for sex. Yes. You're ignoring the fact that that's the power that men had over their daughters. You know, and 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 so you, because you've basically made it all about homosexuality, everything else that that really we should be talking about, or the, the, the abuse the, the, the that's abuse. in there. And um, exploitation, and, and it's not talked about. And this is what, even yeah. when I was coming out and reading it all the years ago, that's what I was looking at. I was thinking, why is it that the world focuses so much on that particular mm -hmm. story, and then about homosexuality? Because there's your delivery. Oh, we've had a pause. <laughs> a pause. 